Herzlich willkommen in Ada zum zur Stream, also alternatives Wirtschaften ist das Hauptthema und äh, wir kommen hier zu einer schönen Podiumsdiskussion. Digitalisierung und Degrowth, Wege zu einem enkeltauglichen Wirtschaft. Ich übergebe daher gerne an Andrea Vetter, die hier das Podium leiten würde. Dann viel Spaß, rückt noch ein bisschen zusammen, falls nach vorne ist noch ein bisschen viel Platz, sodass nachkommende Leute bitte vielleicht nicht durch die halbe Audi Max rennen müssen. Danke. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much and I hope you can hear me all over the hall. A very warm welcome. Bei solchen Großveranstaltungen Menschen sich erst später entscheiden dazu zu kommen und dann And maybe it's a good idea to move together because there are always people who shop late and it would be nice to have a bit of space for them as well so why don't you move together but that's just my proposal right now the next session has been curated by the bits und bäume team and it will deal with digitization and degrowth. By the way, there is an enormous echo. I hear whatever I say twice. I'm not sure whether this can be changed, but that would be a suggestion for the technicians, right? Anyway, <laughs> digitization and degrowth. We need to understand that we need a different economic system in order to make sure that everybody, every human being can lead a good life in a world which works without any consideration of economic growth. Now, it's certainly asking too much if we try to solve this problem this afternoon and yet I do have interesting guests here, pioneers actually, uh, among our panelists, people who have tried to move into this direction. We are going to ponder a number of questions like, for example, how much digitization do we need? How much digitization do we want in order to move into a society characterized by degrowth and how much information is needed in order to successfully do so. I'm very happy to welcome Silke Helfrich. She is an uninstitutional author and yet she is working with two uninstitutions. That's the Commons Institute and the Commons Strategy Group. And I guess some of you know her. She has published it extensively about Commons. Next to her, Frank Karliczek, a software developer for numerous open source projects. And I guess he's well known to a number of people because of the NetCloud project he's been involved in since 2016. He's traveled quite a bit in order to present this particular project to students and others. And in general, he's interested in open source and the private sphere, privacy and digitization in general. And I'm also happy to welcome Tim Widder a freelance engineer and a project engineer with open source ecology in Germany. He's also a lecturer and he's also a counselor and consultant in the field of recycling and open source solutions. I guess all of them will introduce their projects in a minute, but maybe we give them a hand in order to welcome the, them properly.
Right. You are working in projects which try to move into the direction of a different economy. Could you may maybe tell us a bit more about your particular projects? What's special about your projects? How do digital and other tools help you with the alternative economy approach? Andre and uh, Frank, sorry, first. Well, thank you very much. I like this conference. It's special, it's extraordinary, and I guess there are a number of reasons why NetCloud is right here. It's a software, actually, which offers more or less what Google Apps and Office 365 and Dropbox and other softwares offer, but there is a major difference. A, you can host it independently at home or in your company, i.e. you don't have to feed your data into the data storages of the big corporations and then it's also based on open source software, i.e. it's a software developed by the global community and is thus sustainable also with respect to its common goods characteristics. Now, we are using Nextcloud in open source ecology, which is an initiative focusing on open technology and which tries to develop softwares and programs and makes them publicly available. Our blueprints are available online, for example. That's the major difference between us and other corporations that develop software, which normally keep them in their companies, for their companies, whereas we make it public, and that's based on the idea of the commons, i.e., we are trying to truly live the motto that says we are standing on the shoulders of a giants. Since 2013, I've been working with open source ecology, which is a global initiative, but we are focused on the German speaking region. And we are focusing on energy technology, but also storage technologies and others. We also had a an automatic milking bot in our network. That was extraordinary. That's probably the most crazy thing we ever had in the network. We are also talking about values all the time. And of course, we are talking about the question, what materials do we need? do we use? We want to have modularity, we want to have recyclability, we want to be sustainable in what we do. I could also mention other projects, but you can as well visit our website in order to get more information about what we do. The main question for us is, what about the technology of the future? And what about a different approach for what we do. This is not about AI only. It's also about decentralized technologies, i.e. we are not trying to reinvent the wheel time and again. And we try to implement or put into practice the knowledge we provide of already, which is a challenge. We've received a lot of support in the last few years. As I said, our association was founded in 2016, and we've received a lot of support from a number of groups and associations ever since. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about one special project so that uh, everybody can get more information. What about the milking bot? Well, I, I don't want to talk about the milking bot, but open source is important for the Limosola box, which is one of the better developed 
projects in uh, Germany, in Europe, but also in the US. The solar box is probably the smallest tool we offer to show that you can do a lot with solar energy. This system, the box, is programmable, i.e. you can add your own software to it or you can program and develop your own software and apps. So it's a scalable approach as well. Well, I'm in a double disadvantage. I don't have a project on the one hand, and I don't understand really. I can ha can't hear you because of the uh, uh, sound situation, because of the acoustics in this hall. It's almost impossible to hear the others here on stage. Anyway, we invited farmers from Mexico and other Latin American countries, people representing the water movement and human genetics. And then people said, you need to have the open source people on board. That was a recommendation we received because we had invited those uh, farmers and so on. And it was a bit extraordinary for us to think that we need open source people as well. But then we invited them too. And everybody listened to each other. And these software people listened to what the farmers told us about Argentina and the water and the genetic code and so on. And then one of the ladies went on stage and she opened her computer and she just showed one question, which was, for whom does your computer work? And I was really flabbergasted, I need to admit, because, because, because. We are dealing with the environmental movement. We are combating for water. We are working on the topic of erosion in order to try to have enclosures in order to stop the process of erosion in the world. But all this is also about getting information. So for me, it's not about analyzing the project. It's about describing the project in order to find solutions. I think of David Graeber, who once said, we stand up every day and we do capitalism. Why don't we go and do something else? And my question is not, why don't we do something else? My question is, how can we do something else? Else, why do we always play monopoly instead of commons poly? And this is what I've done in the last 12 to so 13 years. This is about fundamental patterns. The developers, software developers, know what I'm talking about because they learned a certain pattern of software development at the university they attended. Because there are certain patterns we followed for ages, no matter whether we sell seeds or share software. And those shared patterns we see, we need to understand in order to find a language, in order to translate, in order to communicate. Now that's a nice game you've brought here. That's a real project. And even if you said you cannot talk about a project, this is one. I myself have dealt with numerous projects in the last few years, projects that try to go new ways. And yet, I'm asking myself, time and again. What can we do in order to make sure that the projects we are involved in become part of the solution instead of being part of the problem? I'm not sure whether you understand what I mean, but what I'm trying to say is we need to be profound or fundamental. We need to have our own hosting. We need the milking robot. 
I love it. I love this bot. Another question is, what can we do so that all this becomes an element in a society which is not profit-oriented anymore? Are these projects part of the solution already? Now, that's my question to you. It's a difficult one, I know. And that's why I wonder who would like to answer it. I will try and answer it. Because I think it's a key question. If you want to trigger change, you can't work in a vacuum. You need to bear in mind how things work these days. You need to accept it, actually. And you need to go and change how things work. You cannot change the world altogether in a given moment. It needs to happen in a step-by-step -step approach. And clearly, you need to bear in mind that you want to change things. And you need to take the right strategic decisions, which isn't easy. Let me give you an example. Next cloud had a predecessor project, which I founded as well. A few years ago, I decided, it was a mistake, I know now, but I decided to maybe push forward the idea of an open source cloud if you set up your traditional startup enterprise. So I co-founded an enterprise. We went to the US. We collected US venture capital in order to fund this idea. And indeed, this helped us speed up processes some things worked faster. We could accelerate. We had means to hire people and so on. But yet, it was a problem because very soon the pro project became much too big and failed because of the very structures of the huge huge U.S. shark basin. Well, uh, can you explain what you mean, like uh, getting completely lost or did not succeed? I mean, there was this idea, an open source community project to be built where the whole world could participate. That was an idealistic project. It will be completely governed by free software, completely oriented oriented towards the need of the people. But there were some things we could not do, we could not implement, because there are the strong financial interests. They're simply there. I mean, when you have an investment of millions, it's difficult to enter into compromise uh, with those people. And so we had to make a completely new start with Nextcloud. We have learned from the past and we do things differently. Nextcloud is an enterprise that is no longer dependent on external investment. No investor can insist making a profit. It's a very boring, simple, limited company that uh, spends the money and that's it. So that's a decision that uh, we or I have taken. Let me follow up on that. Comments, that's an idea and you always relate this way or another on comments, especially when it comes to creative comments licenses or GBL. But comments As a larger overarching idea is something different and it goes back to the problem that you've just raised. You said if we want to do something for the world, we need to have structural independence of the state and uh, business. So the question, how do I finance things? How do I organize things? How do I take decisions within my project? 
all of uh, these issues uh, related to solving conflicts. So that is the logic of commoning. Can we really implement this complete logic of commoning instead of relying on having to involve money and external authorities? So wording such a, an idea for me means that our movement needs to grow and before it really can grow, we need to understand what links us uh, on a deeper level. Not just saying we want to uh, have solidarity, respect human rights, we have the same values. But can we really agree on everything in the world being connected? So my Welfare depends on yours. What I do will have repercussions not only on nature, but all the other people. And then if we, dis that we are try to describe that, then, you know, it's very difficult to give such a description because we are using this, the language of capitalism. Whenever I hear those startups talking about sustainable business models, then I always think there's something completely wrong. The term sustainability is being misabused and the idea that I first have to build a business model instead of trying to shape my relations in a different way, in a way that makes me independent of uh, the state. When we have found such a la language, then we can also determine the right logic for action. And then we just need to act. Here I'd like to quote Ms. Professor Hilti, who said something very beautiful this morning. He said, now imagine we have received so, uh, achieved, achieved so, uh, so much. We now have to face the fact that software can force us to buy new hard hardware. I mean, this idea what does that mean? A green foundation, a research institution that wants to be sustainable, if they really think about that, they would say, we are not going to use Microsoft or any other advanced software anymore because there is no structural independence. There is no digital sufficiency, as we heard this morning, with proprietary software. And these are the simple things that we need to put into words. And once we have those words, where we have this clear-cut language, then we can act. That's very interesting. Can I just briefly add? I think we also have to question the structures. Maybe disrupting is the right word. We have to disrupt these structures. Do things differently. Oftentimes, I get a question about Nextcloud. They said, well, you're such a, quant a small company, 40 people, and indeed you dream of uh, competing with Microsoft, Google, Dropbox. According to classical um, capitalist rules, it's impossible. We have no mono, no people, nobody knows us, we have got no chance. In reality, things can be thought in a different way. We have open source and free software, and so we have a community of 1,800 people who work together with us. Our last version was developed by 1,800 people from all over the world. Of course, they don't get money from us. They have uh, other intrinsic motivations why they join us. I mean, in a capitalist system, such a thing doesn't exist. And uh, people would just contribute because they like the product, something you can't imagine. So we can indeed change the way of thinking. Let me ask you again, what do you, does it take for instruments to be part of the solu solution instead of becoming part of the problem? Probably we would all agree when we say all institutions must stop using proprietary software. Do you think, do you think so? Das machen die alle schon. <laughs> um. But we still have the problem with the hardware, don't we? 
Because even if we use our open source software, uh, good and free solutions, and we put them on computers, then again, these computers come from somewhere. They were manufactured in a factory. All the components in that computer, the raw materials, were produced on the basis of a lot of work, especially the raw materials were mined, oftentimes in conditions of disregard of human and environmental rights. So that's a problem we cannot overcome so easily. Tim, what do you think about that at Open Source Ecology? How do you try to think hardware in a different way? I mean, everything you said about software is true for hardware, too. Making knowledge available is very important. Uh, two years ago, I said access to knowledge must be established as a an inviolable human right. So that would be important to me. In I think everyone in open source community shares this view. Sharing knowledge would mean to know the codes of software to share also the construction plans for the hardware for equipment but then okay one day if we want to build the hardware not just to develop it and share the design if we want to build it we have to have time resources machines Open source ecology was not uh, just about making the technology we have uh, available as uh, open access, but also designing the most important machines that we need so that society can be maintained and preserved with uh, the technology we have. How do we do that? I think open source, source hardware or as an approach is the only opportunity for us to organize a closed loop society. Oftentimes we uh, talk about um, cycles f from cradle to grave and such a process. Approaches. I mean, we buy our mobile phones from China. That's intransparent. But sending uh, it back to China after having used it that's not a proper cycle. We have to know what's inside that mobile phone. Can it be modernized? Can it be updated? Can it be repaired? All of that is only possible if everybody knows the design of a mobile phone. So that is the basis for re for developing not only a cycle economy, but also free access to the creation to the equipment that we have in the world. Let me come back with another question. I think what we are talking about is indeed, as I would say in Marxist talk, a different mode of production, another type of political economy, another type of producing and sharing the things we need for life. If we agree that we have two different groups of things in the world, the material and intangible world, and we need both things to produce things, like for instance water. When I drink this glass empty, you can't have any water anymore. And if we are here and share information, then still the information is there. So there are certain things that get less when we share, like an apple or a cake or the water. And there are things that never diminish the moment we share, like codes, knowledge. And if we agree on such simple things, there are things that get diminished when we use it or share it. For those things, we need an upper limit. I mean, you have said you'd like to be independent of power and state. Who is going to impose the cap? Let me finish my idea first. Then it would not make sense to introduce a cap for the things that we share, like ideas, because everybody benefits and the knowledge increases as we share it. Then 
that would mean that all those who are concerned would have to develop these rules themselves in a different context, not in a context where we think about competing against others, ruling. I would always say we are not competing with uh, Google or whoever. We'd like to be flexible and we like to build a system that is different from capitalism. And if we use our systems, uh, then we wouldn't need capitalism anymore. And that uh, should create more and more attractive opportunities to get up in the morning and doing something different instead of just reproducing capitalism. There's one aspect that I forgot to mention. When we talk about resources, the things that we indeed consume and use up, does it make sense to go on the way we are at the moment? Those people who uh, are innovative and have a better marketing strategy, they would win. That's the logic. And everybody is running the same way, uh, develop uh, similar technologies, use up resources, uh, find a better solution, and you are wasting lots of resources and energy. This is not meaningful because what we need is not competition but a good solution. We like to make sure we get all the things that we need for our life. Uh, doing it uh, in such a way that we do not uh, duplicate work unless we want to reiterate for improvement, that would be a good thing. Of course, you have to have things available right from the start, not just saying, well, it's out there on the Internet. You have to publish, you have to network, you have generate attention. And this is what we do. We try to find actors, identify them and uh, co bring them together with others. I mean, having a solution would then mean, OK, I am going to uh, get the missing links from others. I'm not going to tell anyone about my innovation. I'm not going to inform anyone because I would like to uh, go to market myself and make a profit. This will lead to the inevitable things like uh, um, planned obsolescence, where everybody tries to have a design that you cannot simply replicate. We, if we want to work differently, we have to think about totally different business models. Uh, you've said, I mean, if we were, want to work inside these structures and restructure, then it's not enough to do things differently. We still have to make sure we exist, we continue to exist, which means we can do it in that way that we share our know-how and uh, do not no longer say, OK, we'll produce one product that we sell. Nobody can do the same. We have to be much more plural in order to survive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I just had come up with the idea to stop speaking in the language of capitalism. And I'd like to give you one precise example. Let's say we produce something to sell it. What do we do? We produce a merchandise. And we as an open source community uh, think we produce uh, goods that we would like to sell in the market, then we are capitalists. We think the same as the capitalists. And that would mean we act the same as capitalists. How can it be done differently? Can you get inspiration from the communities that do things differently? And here my uh, slogan at the conference is all hackers should work out in the field. In the field, you can learn from solidarity-based agriculture, how they work, how they become stronger. What they do is they do no longer produce uh, agricultural produce for the market. At the beginning of uh, the year, the farmers say what they need for the coming year. And then they set up a budget and this budget is uh, published and then you have a round of bidders. I cannot explain all the details how it works. It's just the basic pattern that's so interesting. And the basic pattern is 
in the beginning you bring together the necessary amount of money that you need in order to produce over the year. And the result of this production will be shared. It is no longer a merchandise that will be sold in a shop for a price. It's the share in the harvest. There's no such thing as a price or a product or a merchandise. All these terms have disappeared. And the simple pro pattern is to share the production risk. And the more we manage to share our production risks, I mean, I've seen crowd investment companies where they collect six million in a month for an organic farm. We should strengthen such efforts because sharing the production risk before production even starts liberates us of the need to produce merchandise that we sell. And that makes us independent. And that will change the whole political economy. It will also change the complete rest of what we are doing. Don't we need other types of licenses, licenses that don't give the opportunity to protect your merchandise for the purpose of a profit? An open source license, and that's the basic idea of it, namely it's an idea to accelerate innovation. It uh, makes it possible for people who get this open source license to use it for commercial purposes and develop it further. What would be the way out to build a license and such attempts are being made uh, so that those who get a license would be restricted f in use only to, say, cooperatives, open source licenses, a very complex topic. One could talk about it for hours and hours. And every sentence that I'm saying uh, will probably be criticized by experts because I have to reduce myself to the less complex statements in open source free software philosophy. It's not so much directed against uh, commercialization, but rather against proprietary codes. The ideology of free software is nobody will have a problem if you make money with it. There are companies uh, who have employees and need to pay them, so you have to make some money. It is just a problem to make this code proprietary. Knowledge should be freely available. I mean, Creative Commons, for instance, data on Wikipedia are uh, available, but it is explicitly permitted and even desired to use this commercially open source licenses if they say you can use this software, but you're not allowed to make money on the basis of that you may not use it commercially. Maybe some licenses do exist, but it would be very unusual, and I don't know would this license ever be, be bought. For hardware, it's even more stringent. When you produce hardware, you need a lot of material, and of course you need money. For instance, in that field, we have non-commercial licenses. Uh, non-commercial license in that case is impossible because um, for materials you have to pay. And uh, excluding the commercial utilization uh, is not possible. But there is a discussion about that. There are models like uh, a fair lift or copy lift license. Such ideas are around. And uh, the copy lift uh, license at the moment is a super transition period because the hardware development can be improved and that creates a, an added value to the community. So, of course, you have to define your terms, what must be published about the newly developed de design, how quickly do you have to publish. Uh, when you start a project, usually it's a longer cycle for hardware. In software, you get the results more easily. Are we talking about months or years? Well, depends on the project. If uh, I design a wind turbine, you can be sure it takes a couple of years until it's finally fit for everyday use. That's a difficulty we are faced with when talking about hardware. And we have to introduce this uh, license to make things available, knowledge available. There's also the Seno license. 
but on principle, one can say every technology that I document and publish is state of the art and can no longer be patented. This is a law, so it's not a problem, but still the question of liability remains, the question of the material. Do I share the CAD models in uh, original format or do I give uh, just PDF and step-by-step -step instructions so that the generator of uh, the t um, turbine can be used somewhere else? Uh, so this t theme is being discussed. We are talking to the dean at the moment. We are trying to develop standards that would make it possible, first of all, to make a start, saying, OK, we have one common denominator, and uh, here we move on, on the basis of this denominator. It's a question that I cannot answer for sure at the moment, because the question of how do I define, for instance, cooperative use? Cooperation, uh, cooperatives are a topic that are discussed globally. So what does mean you may use this or that development only for cooperatives. Such a license is difficult to define and it's also dangerous because you can exclude things that you didn't want to exclude. Indeed, it's a complex topic, but a copyleft uh, license is a good idea. Let me challenge what you say. Well, I need to say challenge, even if I speak German, I don't have any choice. But I really like what you said. We should try and avoid the capitalist vocabulary and the change starts small is also true. Alas, it also depends on our claims on our demand and what we want. If it's sufficient to change things just for ourselves or if we, we or if you want to change more. Now, when it comes to agriculture, I could go and say it's uh, about a group. And I try to not use concepts like the competition. But we need to be aware of the fact that your local farm competes with Aldi or Nestle, right? We are dealing with dimensions and we need to be aware of who our opponents or enemies are. It's nice to change your small, your little world, your own little world, but don't you want to achieve more? I agree. And I don't want to insinuate that the big world does not exist. But I think it's very important to also focus on the fact that you need to build something different, which is charming in terms of its logic. It needs to feel good, so to speak, and it's more. And it needs to be more in order to be carried out of the world and in order to be different. And once I've tried the vegetables offered by Solabi, I will never ever buy them anywhere else again. And what about the rest of the world? Now, since solidarity farming knows no competitors, we can have as much of it as we want. And there will never be any competition among those farms. This is certainly an excellent way to start producing 
what we need on our own in our own farms. And this is also about autonomy and self sufficiency. The charm of the idea of the commons for me is the small and not the big. And we need to share ideas instead of competing with ideas. We want to be independent. We want to be free. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want to be bound, but we would like to follow the concepts of fairness and a social approach. Free, fair, and a life in one concept needs to be the vision so that people like you go and say, it's cool, I like it. But the farmers need to go and say, it's cool, I like it as well. This is about developing a vision which takes us out of our eternal fear of failing or of losing our jobs. I'm not afraid to lose of losing a job. I haven't had a job for ages. This is a major challenge, indeed. But we're also learning to rely on the power of the community. And then, what about commerce? What about money? I'm not saying that this is not about money. And of course, there is money involved, but the logic is a different one, meaning I don't have to sell the product anymore. I don't depend on whether I can sell it or not. We need to ask what can we do in order to mutually co-fund each other. And here, the state plays a role, too. Now, I would like to invite the audience. And I'd like to ask you to spend the next five minutes in order to address the person sitting next to you, in order to talk about what you've just heard and what is important for you and what is on my mind right now. So please, talk to your neighbors. And afterwards, there will be an open mic here, a roaming, roving mic so that you can also ask questions, your own questions or interesting questions you heard from the person sitting next to you. Ja, 
den Punkt, den du angesprochen hast, der ist echt gut. Vielleicht greife ich den nun mal auf. Was? Ja, das geht nicht. <lacht> Nein, das geht auch nicht. Also was? Den Punkt, den du angesprochen hast, dass man sozusagen diese Chance auch für sich erkennt, diese Freiheit und Freiheit, die die da sind, zu nutzen und die sozusagen als Qualität für jemanden verfügbar macht, das muss man auch, glaube ich, mal erlebt haben. Also nicht jeder Mensch hat die Chance gehabt, zum Beispiel, also ich bin bei Professor Psychology durch Zufall gelandet. Also es, es gab halt das Thema in einem Seminar, wissenschaftliches Arbeiten irgendwie. Ich habe halt eine Seminararbeit dazu gemacht und habe da das ganze Feld für mich erschlossen. Wow, was man alles machen kann, ja. ja die Wirtschaft ja, irgendwie tickt und was man selber irgendwie auch bewegen kann. Und bin aus dieser Vision heraus, wo man eigentlich hinkommen könnte, irgendwie da reingerutscht. Ich wollte eigentlich nur die Windturbine mitdesignen. Das war mein Plan, aber irgendwie bin ich dann im ganzen Orga-Kram gelandet und äh, genau. Ich habe natürlich auch eine ganze Menge dazugelernt, also von Schweißen bis Organisieren und Planen und Sonstigen. Aber das ist auf jeden Fall etwas, was ich glaube ich jedem wünschen würde. Also diese Chance zu erhalten, einmal in diesem partizipativen Teil irgendwie mitzuwirken und zu merken, man ist nicht alleine. Man kann wirklich gemeinschaftlich unglaubliche Sicherheitsbedingungen schaffen. In Energieanstellungen, in Bildschirmeinstellungen. Achso, das kann ich auch ausschalten. Ja, das kannst du auch ausschalten eigentlich. Hast du für die Kamera ist das vielleicht ein bisschen blöd? Ja, weil es die ganze Zeit das Licht, ja. Das ist mal ganz gut. Ich weiß ja, wie es geht. Also jemand zu sagen... Ach cool, du hast sogar Ubuntu noch besser. Das ist ein Glück drin. Okay, dann mach mal. Gerade in dem Bereich dort zu zeigen, also ich denke ja, dass wir im IT-Bereich sozusagen verlieren auf der ganzen Linie. Momentan, ja. Ja, vielleicht sollten wir das auch mal sagen. Dass es deswegen, glaube ich, auch so gut ist, dass wir hier so eine Nee, das ist ein guter Punkt, ich sollte mit Janus sagen. Ich sollte mit Janus sagen. Ich mache mit Janus sagen. Wenn du das zu ja, machst, ja, krieg ja. den Übersetzer an die Ohren. Ich brauche ja gleich runter und mach mal mit Dr. Dr. Wie wir vorhaben. Alles gut bei dir? Also die ganze Zeit. Ich höre schon auf. Ja, das ist ja sehr interessant. Ja, okay. Ja, aber ich denke, es haben sich genug gemeldet, oder? Okay. 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 Okay.
weiter. Das engagierte Murmeln. Ich würde euch bitten, langsam hier eure Aufmerksamkeit wieder nach vorne zu richten. Herzlichen Dank. Now thank you for this interactive slot. We have about 30 minutes left. In other words, you can still ask questions to our panelists. And I would like to ask you to ask a question you've heard from the person sitting next to you, a question which makes you think this question has to be asked. As I said, we have a roving mic. I would like to collect three or four questions in each round in order to then listen to the answers from the panelists. And I would like to also have men and women speak in turns. Ja, hallo. Hier ist Andreas Salam. Andrea Salam, Green Net Project is my name, i.e. my project. I've heard the question from people sitting behind me. Benjamin is sitting behind me and he asked, well, do we still need money? I mean, would it be possible to do without money or find a substitute? And... I would like to add that we are trying to implement the principle of solidarity also in the IT world, which creates trust and confidence among the people also in the IT industry, and that's good. Any women or female read persons who would like to take the floor. I'm representing the Neufahner University of Lüneburg and I talked to my neighbors and they had different questions but there is one question we would like to raise here publicly and that's a question to the three of you, the three panelists. We would like to ask about standards. Are there any standards which need to be redesigned because this is also about uh, controlling processes. might be interesting to hear your answers to this question. We would like to ask, what can we do in order to mitigate the production risk a posteriori? That was, so to speak, the conclusion of our debate posteriori, meaning after, because you need to satisfy fundamental needs. And sometimes later, so to speak, ex post, you find more questions which would like to ask. What about cooperatives? Do cooperatives matter? That was a question I heard from the people sitting next to me.
because we heard that you can also make money by working in a cooperative, by working collaboratively. You said the net cloud that was like 800,000 people crowd funding the project. Now, thank you for your questions. There will be a second round. If you haven't had a chance to ask it now, please don't forget it. I would like to ask you to give the answers, first of all. Maybe I did not have enough time to explain what we do. Normally, I do have more time. So, next cloud is open source and free of charge for everybody. We have millions of users all over the world and everybody can use the system. It's affordable to everybody. That's what I'm saying. Now, making money with such project next cloud This is not a commercial enterprise. This is not about making profits. This is about being paid in order for, for what you do. Or this is about gaining or generating revenue in order to pay for the work. I, I, used, I used to work in a number of initiatives where open source software was developed and nobody was paid, but I realized that in a given moment, you hit the limit because sometimes you need people work. You need that you need people to work on the project, not only on weekends, not only on a voluntary basis, which makes it necessary to pay a purse because people need to work in order to make money, in order to buy food, and so on. Now, I'm not quite sure whether I can answer the other questions that were raised, including the question whether the world would work without money. Now, a world without money would be a barter pro project, probably, I guess. But I'm not the person to give an answer to that question. I'm not the right one. I'm not an expert either, but I do have ideas about money. First of all, I would like to ask the question whether we, we, de we need money at all. Money is a means to help us do what we do. And we are exchanging, so we should not talk about the means, we should talk about what we do. It's trading. Reciprocity is the concept used by anthropologists in order to describe what we do and there are different forms of reciprocity, direct one, indirect one, you name it. Now, the logic of money is based on the assumption of an equivalent principle of exchange. In other words, what I get and what I give needs to have the same value, but this is not the case in the real world either because there is no equivalence between the goods and the money. But the fundamental idea is, of course, that things are exchanged which are of equal value. But then there are also situations in which I have a different kind of reciprocity or exchange, i.e. I don't get money. I just think it's all right the way it is. I give something, I get something back, but there is no money involved. It's difficult to think the world without the idea of reciprocity. It's difficult to think the world, to think a world in which people feel cheated all the time which is what economists are telling us, but others tell us the same. So we need careful reciprocity so that people offer what they have, knowing that once they need something, there is enough in the pot they can benefit from. 
i.e. a world in which there is nobody who only gives and nobody who only takes. This is the philosophy of openness, which kind of pretends that everything is open to everybody in every given moment, but that's not the smartest way to approach the problem because in order to get something out I need to put something in first of all I need to contribute in order to share and the question how we share and how we contribute is also important which gets me to the question of the production risk. What do we do if we act too late? Now, this gets me to the idea of alliances, commons alliances is what we call it, but we always call it commons something. So we try to offer security in mutual structures or in structures of mutuality and beyond these structures. We could ponder associations which are characterized by solidarity. The health insurance we are having still today is more or less what we are talking about, or the syndicates of housing estates. I mean, that's what they do. They offer advance payments or funding and they know that sometimes small projects don't have the funds to pay up front. What we do is certainly more sustainable once we manage to establish the structures that support these approaches, the standards. Now, I would like to answer all questions, like the question about money and whether there are alternatives. What about cryptocurrencies? It doesn't have to be bitcoins always. The Faircoin project is an interesting one, for example, if you ask me. Or an open ecoin project, that's what we discussed in order to create machines. These are exciting ideas, I'd say. Collectives. That was also the subject matter of another question, and we also worked on the idea of collectives because there are a number of groups and activists in the open source community, and there are different types of exchange which are feasible. Alas, I cannot go into detail here. It would be much too much. Now, standards. We've talked to the DIN, which is the German Agency for Standardization. We don't get their support yet, but we are trying to identify the smallest common denominator in order to allow for certification or licensing. Tesla is interesting example here because they made their products available free of charge and people said this is about open source but then if you try to find the source you don't find it and this is not about software this is about hardware so we're trying to find ways and means to also help companies to implement the process of standardization and right now 18 institutions are involved and the number is increasing by the day and if you are interested please get in touch you find us in the patio in the third floor table number seven or booth number seven that's where you find us and please come and see us there in order to ask more questions because we are truly interested in putting our standardization project into practice. It's certainly the most concrete project we've been working on so far.
The other answers have been given already. Haben zu allen Fragen etwas gesagt? Zu den Genossenschaften. I think we have answered all questions. And so I'm going to take on board a number of uh, additional questions, if there's anyone. No, there is somebody indeed who didn't have a chance to ask a question, the lady in the red sweater. And then we've got three more questions. Hello. My neighbor asked how to strengthen the cooperation between different commons projects. King and I was as well. Uh, what next? What's the next step for open source? But let me add to that part of my question and then there is that often open source, as much as I love it, uh, feels like one hand clapping. Uh, that, that the other part of it is to still fight the capitalism that's trying to squash open source. And if, if we don't do the two things together, we can't possibly win. Still can use the example of agriculture, and, and she mentioned seeds. And that's a perfect example because seeds are, in the world, 80% open source. But they're still losing ground because what we have is an industry which is using regulation to prevent seeds from being exchanged by farmers and using intellectual property rights to prevent the open source seeds from, from being shared and is using new technologies to actually contaminate the open source seeds uh, and to prevent them from being used safely in the marketplace. So unless there is a fight against the bad guys, the good guys can't win. So that's my one hand clapping concern. We need to have both sides, if you could comment on that. Thank you. Hello. Um, we have asked how sich We were wondering how does next cloud finance itself? I mean, where do you take your money f uh, from for your employees once everything is open source? My neighbor's gone, but I'd like to ask the question anyway. We talked about comments a lot, and for me, the idea is fairly new. But the title of this event was Digitalization and Degrowth. And in spite of all the comments approaches and in spite of the idea, how can we link it up? How can we make sure that we can apply um, open source and commons to the entire economy? Does anyone want to make a start? Let me start. Regarding the question about Nextcloud. Nextcloud, as I said, is an open uh, source free software, can be used free of charge and is being used by millions of people around the world. Most of these people are either families or smaller and medium sized uh, companies. There's the 1% very big ones like Deutsche Bundesverwaltung, the German uh, General Administrative Office, uh, ARD, a public TV station uses, uh, Siemens uses our software in context. And uh, as a rule, um, uh, companies want uh, service contracts, and this is what we sell. So you can use our software free of charge, but if you want our staff to give you support and maintenance or uh, training seminars, then you have to have a contract with us, and this is what we use as an income. So only 1% of the pyramid is paid services, and the rest is really free of charge. I can say also a few things about how different Commons projects work together. Again, I could talk about it for hours and hours, but one aspect might be important enough to mention here namely the compatibility of licenses. You have said Commons does not mean that everybody can do anything with what they get from you. You can limit the usage, uh, like Creative Commons, which gives limitations how much of it you can use commercially. 
for open source software licenses, there are certain things you can say, okay, should be used by everyone except for the military. You can make such restrictions and limitations, and this is a broad spectrum of limitation, and uh, that oftentimes prevents cooperation because the projects have different ideals and ideas about what should be indeed completely open, what should be restricted. You asked about degrowth. We as Open Source Ecology, have, we have not only the task to develop the technology. We want to do it in a way that it is fit for our next generation. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the limits of growth? What is uh, our society? A democratization of uh, technology development would also mean that, first of all, we look at who would like to be participating in decision making. And whom would we like to participate in that process? And of course, maybe not everybody wants their printer to break down after a number of pages. Many want to have a, a long-lived project. And of course, that is a challenge for industry. But without the Internet, we would not be in a position to do this kind of open source. And we are only just at the beginning as far as hardware production is concerned or design is concerned. And here we need a complete shift of uh, values. We need it. We try to walk the talk. We build so-called ecolabs. So if you know a place that would be fit for a, an ecolab that provides transparency, sustainability, please um, inform us. We have uh, set up a platform, openecolab.de. Open so this is done to find the places that are sustainable. There we would like to create model spaces, indeed to walk the talk, to show that it can be done, that we can share our success. And this is the uh, opportunity also to use digital digitalization to promote degrowth. Silke, how about the question that came regarding doing comments on the one hand side and uh, combating capitalism on the other side and can that and how can that contribute to the degrowth movement and uh, what is the relationship to the state and its role let's start with pat mooney's question we had discussed this question on the panel too We discussed it in the context of I2, IT. Sorry. We said, I mean, at the moment we are really losing. There is this very quick concentration of control on data, software, always built up the same way and always uh, commercial. All of that makes us so dependent. And we have developed a habit for not questioning that in, uh, anymore. And this is really institutionalized. And I think that is uh, absolutely disastrous. So as soon as uh, somebody s says, OK, we have proprietary software and we give it to an um, to an African ministry so that they can equip their schools, then it's a Trojan horse. We know it. And I did think that we are in the process of losing this uh, battle because the battle for free software is a political battle and obviously the politicians didn't do enough and the idea of free software software that helps us to defend our freedom and build up independent structure that was something that didn't materialize so i would be very happy if this conference raised people's awareness again we need to act and regain our political sovereignty and this can be said for all other topics. I personally can only say the work of commons is something like an antidepressant. Next to the 
battles, the organizations and the political combat, I need something to be constructive. I need to have people who invite me to come in and build something up. And we indeed, as it was said by Pat, we need both hands. We need to work with comments on the one hand side. And uh, it is wonderful to have this conference where not only the environmentalists and uh, the techies get together, but also those who have embarked on a political struggle, a struggle that we should support with our software. The question about software, thank you for reminding us. Sometimes we talk and talk and we think, yes, everything is clear. For me, nothing is clear. When we just pool knowledge and share knowledge, make it available on the internet, so people on the other side of the world can download the design and build their own tractor. Does That means that it's a, a tractor that need not be built in Europe and sent to the other end of the world. It's the so-called Cosmo local production, the idea of producing that way. Being independent of external financing would mean we would get rid of two growth drivers. The first one, the quest for capital. Capital as a growth driver, we can get rid of it because step by step we can develop our own stuff and be independent. And we get rid of uh, the sales imperative. We need to advertise. We need to sell. And then we have the driver of transport and energy costs that we can get rid of. Such a production would make sure that people can produce locally. In the peer-to-peer -peer scene, they say share everything that is lightweight, like a bit, and produce everything locally that is heavy. There's no need to transport things around the world. I can just emphasize what you said. We are not in a good and stable situation as far as IT is concerned or cloud computing, or AI and all the related topics. As you said, we are in the process of losing the battle. If we now look at agriculture once more, then we indeed are in a situation where in a couple of years from now, all potatoes in the world will be produced by just five farmers who are located in the east of the US. We are going to see an extreme centralization and that is not good. Because imagine, it is not healthy. And it is our common task now to try and disrupt this process, turn it around, change it, because we are not going the right way. Well, the challenges are clear. My activity at Open Source Ecology was based on an accident. I just wanted uh, to write a thesis. And I discovered a whole new world. It was in 2013. I can say today, you can make things happen. You can make a difference. And it's fun working with these people. Let me encourage all of you to just be part of such a process because you're no longer going to feel alone. You have a great network, great contacts that you can use. And that gives you a sense of security. And this is the strength of open source. And. Uh, what links us as a community, as a society, is uh, indeed this common work. So talk to your peers, talk to the people you know, try to bring in people. And uh, we also try to introduce uh, industry. This is what we do on the basis of uh, standardization. Try not only to pinpoint the problems, but try to find common answers together with everyone. And I'd be happy to see some of you again in one of our Commons project. I would like to thank you now. Thanks to all participants on stage. I think we have talked about many interesting issues. 
And as usual, uh, probably we are going to leave the room with more questions than answers. And so we can follow up with part two, the growth and digitalization. How can we use the free spaces? How can we network and how can we integrate also existing traditional institutions? How can we talk about more societal changes? But we are going to have ample opportunity in the course of this uh, conference to talk about that. Rolf Buschmann, our stage host, is going to say a few words. And let me also say we have the concept network, Neue Economy, New Economy Concept Network, and you can get more information from my colleagues from the network. Next to alternative management. If you're interested uh, in that, you can go to Emacs, where we are going to speak about sustainability assessment of digital companies. And we are going to have corporate digital responsibility in another workshop. Ada here is going to deal with the topic of reclaiming a smart city. Have a nice break and see you soon. Tschüss.